welcome everyone. Um, hello, wildlings, all the audience out there. I hope you've had a great couple weeks since we've talked to you last. Um, this is our sixth, number six, of what is, what is now a nine episode workshop series, looking how different um, industry professionals are using new technologies to streamline compliance. So far, we covered construction monitoring, mapping in mobile GIS, wetlands, photo management, veg management, and taxonomy. You can go to the events tab on our website to see what's coming as well as access past episodes. So thanks everyone for joining. These have been um, a lot of fun to do. Really great to interact with our customers and get to know them better. And if you have any topics you're interested in, please put that in the chat. Um, we're doing this bi-weekly summer series. And then I think in the fall, if we've got more topics um, that would be of value to the community, then we'll probably go to a monthly schedule. Uh, we really wanna keep these sessions open and focused on any of the tools and techniques our guest experts use to make their work easier. And boy, do we have a doozy today. Um, our audience has been asking to see more of Wild Note. So at the end of this, we will offer a short demo um, specifically related to our cultural resource management and archeological surveys um, within WildNote. And we hope you'll ask questions. That makes the, that makes the half hour um, go by better. Uh, people get more value the more questions that are asked. So please ask us questions in the Q&A. And we hope you walk away with real solutions to real problems. My name, Kristen Hazard, founder and CEO of WildNote. I have um, a couple folks from WildNote with me today. We've got Nancy Douglas. Hi, Nancy. Hello. <laughs> Rini Hi, <laughs> Hi Rini. Hello. All right. So Nancy's our director of customer success. She's a perfectly titled person. Uh, our customer's happiness is absolutely her happiness. And Rini is our Director of Sales and Marketing. So thanks for being here. And I will um, and I will uh, intro Chris a little bit later after we get some um, housekeeping items taken care of. So go ahead, Nancy. Right on. Hey, thanks, Kristen. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Chris, for being here today. Um, there's two ways to communicate with us during the workshop. The first one's via the chat, which you'll find at the bottom of the Zoom window. So chat with us for any technical issues, and I'll do my best to help you with that. And then if you have questions for the panelists, please post them in the Q&A area, which is also at the bottom of the Zoom window. And just, um, Kristen said, if you get inspired uh, about a person or a topic that you'd like to see featured, uh, send that to me in chat, and we'll make note of that as well. Uh, so, you know, the basic format will be intros of Chris, then he'll talk about the problems that he's been trying to solve using uh, digital technology with his cultural resources work and probably lots of other interesting things that he likes to talk about. And uh, hopefully we'll get to some of his go-to apps that he uses in the field. And then we'll have questions and answers. And um, after that, as Krista mentioned, we'll do a demo when this is all wrapped up for anybody who wants to stick around for that. And then on a final note, <clears throat> we can't have virtual lunch with you, but we are working with Territory Foods to provide meals to frontline healthcare workers. And we chose them because everybody knows somebody who's putting themselves on the front line uh, for this pandemic. And so for every workshop attendee, there are two meals that are being provided and Territory Foods contributes a third. So, so far with our, all of our workshops, we're up to 390 meals that have been provided to frontline healthcare workers. So thanks for coming. We really appreciate it. Back to you, Kristen. All right, thank you, Nancy. Okay, so Chris Webster, um, I was thinking of adjectives for him. He's a true, true champion of digital archaeology. He's an evangelical. Uh, he's he's leading the effort to bring technology into archaeology, and that's how we met him. Um, he invited us to be a guest on one of his podcasts. I think probably the technical digital archaeology one. Yeah. Um, and uh, we were fast friends with him then, and he saw immediately that uh, what we were doing at Wild Note could benefit his industry. And we actually ended up partnering um, and creating our archaeological and cultural resource management product line in partnership with Chris. He was, he's just been an amazing asset to bringing the knowledge um, 
of what archaeologists do out in the field to us so that we could build something that would add value to that industry. So we've known him for a couple years now and worked very closely with him. We're so happy to have him here. Um, I will start with from you know his education. He's got a BA in anthropology, a master's in archaeological resource management, and he's a registered professional archaeologist. Uh, he spent time, this one sounds great, Chris, he spent time on an expedition in the cradle of humanity, the Old Dubai Gorge, is that right? Old Dubai, yep, Old Dubai. that's right. In Tanzania, <laughs> that must have been incredible. Um, and he's mm -hmm. been a shovel bum, my favorite industry term, uh, in uh, 18 <laughs> different U.S. states and most of the ecological regions of the country. He's managed 30,000 plus acre projects as a field archaeologist. And I bet digital uh, really comes in handy in something like that. Um, and if that isn't enough, he's also a licensed drone pilot and a licensed private pilot serving as the squadron commander of the Reno Composite Squadron of the Civil Air Patrol and is responsible for 48 adult members, 36 cadets, and two advanced search and rescue aircraft. I call him the pod father because um, I listen to a lot of podcasts and one of the pod fathers of podcasting is Bill Simmons. I don't know if anyone out there knows of him, but he's a sports podcaster and he was one of the very first to understand the power of podcasting. And I would say in our little world of environmental compliance and archaeology, Chris Webster is the pod father <laughs> because he started way before anybody was even thinking podcasts. He started his digital technologies in archaeological consulting, dig tech, and the Archaeological Podcast Network, um, which is also known as the APN, which now has over 18 podcasts with 25 expert hosts and over 1,000, 100,000 monthly subscribers. That's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. Yep. Managed with Tristan Boyle, the APN is the only podcast network dedicated to education about archaeology. Chris hosts and manages four of those podcasts. So welcome, welcome, Chris Webster. So happy to have you here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Awesome. Glad to be here. All right. So we like to start out with um, getting to know you a little better by having you please share with us um, a story from the field. It can be anything, um, and a crazy day, a beautiful day, a wonderful day, something you would like to share with us about your time out in the field, Chris? I'll tell you, it, the one that always comes to mind when I think about a story like this is I was monitoring a site down in uh, central Florida around Lake Okeechobee the big lake that's right in the middle of Florida, central Florida. And there were these uh, sugarcane fields right next to the lake where the sugarcane had just been abandoned by the company. They weren't actually uh, farming it anymore. So the sugarcane's like 10 feet tall. And we're doing this project where two things happen. One, we're walking through these sugarcane lanes and there's just red ants, fire ants all over the place, um, feral pigs and alligators in the <laughs> overflowing canals. So not only are we dealing with that, right? So we're, we're doing survey through that. But the time when I was monitoring is one that really sticks out in my head because I'm trying to find this location and there's a bulldozer driver that I was working with in the past and I saw him, he was up on the other side of one of these big canals and the canals are overflowing with water. They're just like right up to the edge because nobody's monitoring them anymore yeah. and keeping them drained. And the, the, the water's all dirty and muddy so you can't even like see into them. Yeah. So he's standing on the, he's on the other side of one of these, um, canals and he's up on this tall dike uh, on top of his bulldozer and he's explaining to me how to get to somewhere and I'm having a hard time hearing him because he's like 50 feet away and I'm getting closer and closer and I'm like walking through the mud just getting closer and closer away from my vehicle and when he's done he's like oh yeah and you better watch out for that alligator and I looked down <laughs> and there was this all I saw was the nostrils and the eyes above the water probably three feet in front of me so like and I just I just jumped like this. My feet slipped out from under me and I landed on my back in the mud and I thought, that's it. He's going to drag me into the canal. I'm done. Um, but that scared the, luckily that scared the alligator away and I got all muddy into my truck. And, uh, oh my that God, was, Chris. That oh. was that day. <laughs> you see those wildlife videos of those alligators controlling and grabbing things from yeah. the side there. That's crazy. Well, and that place was like a whole Jurassic Park situation, right? Like they were just left to run wild. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just like own the place <laughs> wow yeah. well thank you for that um so the next segment that we like to go to is problem solved um basically mm -hmm. 
this one, uh, we usually try to understand a problem that you were facing uh, out in the field in your data collection and management when you decided to go digital. Um, I mm. think that this is an interesting question for you just because you've been such an advocate for digital archaeology for so many years, but I'm sure you have some examples of even, you know, projects that you decided to use WildNote on and what problems you solved by doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And well, let me start at the beginning too, real quick, because I mean, I, I was in grad school at the University of Georgia in 2010. Hey, hold on, you're an archaeologist. The beginning of what exactly? <laughs> the beginning Which of my beginning? digital <laughs> the beginning of my digital journey, so to speak. Okay, so, great. She wasn't sure yeah. beginning. Because a lot, of, a lot of archaeologists will get into digital, so to speak, uh, with databases and GIS and stuff like that. But that's all just par for the course now with archaeology. That's just like part of archaeology is doing GIS and mapping and, and you know, having a database. That's common these days. But right. in 2010, we didn't have a great way other than the Trimble devices and Windows CE operating system, things like that, to like create some forms and do some things. But in April of 2010, the entire industry changed and Apple introduced the first iPad. Mm -hmm. We've been doing some small things on phones and stuff, but it just wasn't powerful enough. And I bought that first iPad in grad school. Uh, didn't tell my wife that I put it on the credit card. Uh, she was working hard out here in Nevada while I was in grad school, you know, not having a job, spending two thousand dollars on an app on an iPad. And uh, but I saw the I saw the value of it, and I bought that iPad a week after they came out, and I instantly had the Apple apps on there, pages, and in and numbers. And in numbers, I created some input forms right. for some work that we were doing right there at the school. We were we had a shallow geophysics class, and we were collecting data on one of the cemeteries there. And I instantly brought that out and everybody was like, oh, that's never going to work. You know, they were just skeptical of it. And tell you what, my team collected all our data pretty efficiently and exported it as spreadsheets, brought it into our databases and were able to do the analysis before the other team even transcribed their handwritten notes. Right. So from that moment on, I was like, okay, well, this is where it's at. And I just kept looking for solutions uh, from designing my own application to using other third-party applications to getting into some other app development until I found WildNote. And then we started producing those forms and I've used WildNote on every project I've done as a company owner um, and other projects as well for what, three, four years now, however long we've been yeah. having these conversations, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so even way back then with uh, pages and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and numbers. The iPad. You know, I bet that's a repeat story, uh, Chris. You buying new digital devices without telling your wife. <laughs> repeat that's right. That's right. That's right. That's happened a few times, I think. <laughs> yeah. So, Chris, what what problem were you really trying to solve, and what problems well, have you seen solved? I mean, you've been doing this for a long time now. Initially, I was just trying to solve the problem of being left-handed, to be honest. Nobody can read my handwriting. But then uh, I tried solving, the, and, and really, that's, that's kind of a joke, but then it goes into, you know, people are hot and sweaty out in the field, and they're, they're writing down these things on dirty field forms, even if you're using like a write-in-the-rain notebook or something like that, which is what we typically use on the East Coast. Yeah. And sometimes that transcription of just trying to figure out not only what somebody wrote, but then you know, you might type in the wrong thing when you're trying to transcribe that into a database or a spreadsheet or into a form or something like that. Those errors right there have been common in archaeology since we started doing archaeology, right? Because we've been typing forms up and doing things for decades, and that has to be transcribed. And so those errors have been happening throughout. Anybody who's seen an old site record just sees the spelling errors and all the things that happen in those and, and some of the issues with it. So there's that problem right there, but then there's the next one is efficiency. You know, we never have the budgets and the time to take as much time as we want on these projects. These aren't academic projects in CRM. They have a limited time frame and a limited budget. People aren't getting paid very much. And how do you get them paid more? Well, you have more headroom in the budget to be able to actually have those higher salaries and do those things. You know, that's why I, I, this project I'm going on next week. I'm, I'm, out, I'm out there with three different, two other companies. We're sharing the workload because the project has to be done quick. And my salaries are probably 25% higher than theirs. And they've been established for 20, 30 years. And the reason is I'm fully digital and we're more efficient and we just don't have the overhead that they do. And mm -hmm. it's, um, and that's, so that's the other reason is, you know, efficiency and then just, budget you know it, it sure it costs money to get the right application that you're using but the you know the 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 benefits far outweigh the costs in the, in many cases when we talk to project managers about the value they get from a tool like wildnote 
it's often um, consistent data, consistency mm -hmm. in the data and the yeah. type of the way the data is given to them. And, you know, like with pick lists and so forth in the mm -hmm. actually the data that's chosen from those pick lists. So that's a yeah. huge, huge benefit to the project managers is actually getting data that's consistently collected across multiple people. Um, Absolutely. And I didn't even think about that as an example because I've been doing it for so long. Like I'm just used to consistent data at this point, yeah. whereas a lot of people aren't. Right. You know? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Chris, do you ever come up against um, an, a moment when you need to find data? So like accessibility of the data, if somebody's coming in and asking what happened on a certain day, are there events like that in, in the work that you do? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you might be working with an agency or a client that's just like, I need to know what happened here and when. But I think I think another thing that is advantageous with using uh, some sort of digital resource is usually the data is stamped with the user and the date and time. And that is a huge problem in CRM because you have, you know, shovel bums using the term affectionately. Yeah. They'll be on a project recording notes and uh, the project manager or field director might not get to those notes until two, three months later. And every one of us that's done that has had that phone call when we were three or four projects past the one we were on. They say, hey, do you remember shovel test number 503? What did you write here? I was like, mm -hmm. I don't even remember that day, let alone that yeah. shovel test. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that was yeah. too long ago. Yeah. Yeah. So having that data accessible and then, and well, and not only that, you might not even know who to call, right? Because if you just turned in a bunch of paperwork and maybe somebody didn't put their name on it or they didn't yeah. have their whatever, but every single piece of data in the right digital system will have somebody's name attached to it. And that's yeah. super handy. Yeah. So handy. Um, can you talk about the project uh, that you did recently with WildNode? It was kind of a early COVID mm -hmm. situation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In fact, California was shut down like within the last three days of that project. We didn't know if we were going to get it done or not. Yeah. Uh, it was on a Navy base out near um, Ridgecrest, California. And in fact, it wasn't even on the base. It was land owned by the base. Uh, so just outside. And that was awesome because COVID, sure, California was shut down right at the end of that project, but we had known about coronavirus for weeks up until that point. In fact, I don't think the whole town had any toilet paper. That's the phase that we were in. Right. And uh, so, which made it real interesting. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> so, we, um, so we're doing this project and I've got uh, th four other people out there besides myself. I think it was four. Yeah, besides myself. And we're doing this project and, and everybody was using their own devices. We were all using WildNote actually, and everybody's using their own devices. And it was just really handy from a, we don't know anything about this virus standpoint because I didn't have to take their paperwork. I didn't have to hand them paperwork. I didn't have to even take their tablets or devices back to the, you know, back to the hotel room where my wife and I, she was on the project as well. She's an right. archeologist. And we didn't have to expose ourselves to unknown hazards um, by taking in those things. So we were able to, uh, basically manage all the data for that project remotely because at the end of the day we would have them just sync their devices that was part of our workflow sync your device at the end of the day so we have all your data and then we can look at the site records and um, make sure everything is consistent when we go out the next day and that was just really handy to be able to have that yeah yeah only available with a um, digital with a digital solution not and, only a digital solution there, but an online based one. Yeah, where you can have that cloud service. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Did you did you have to have access to any of like your customer like you were able to get your data out to them as well. I mean, I thought there mm -hmm. was something about that where Yeah. Where so we had the, the client base was shut down. Yeah, we had the client and and they were able to access the data um our, our contact there, she had to go home because they shut the whole base down. And, but she was still able to access the data remotely from her home computer. But not only that, I was a subcontractor on this project. I wasn't even writing the report. I was just doing the field work and the site records and the subcontractor during that time, their whole office shut down. So the project, um, basically the principal investigator, um, another researcher they had working on information for the site records and then their GIS department are in three different locations and they were all easily to access easily able to access all the data and work together remotely because we had it um, online and well known. Mm -hmm. Chris, what about photo management um, with using yeah. a tool like this? Like what have you found with that? Well, I've, I've said in the past when I've talked to people, I said, listen, if, even if you only do photo management, 
on your digital devices, whatever program you're using, if all you did was manage your photographs and create photo logs and photo pages, regardless of where you, where you work, you would probably save a ton of money and time. Um, so photo management is huge because it's such a time suck, you know, over here in Nevada and in California, um, you've got to put them two up on a page and then put all this data next to them. And sometimes the formatting goes wonky and you got to, you know, it's just to be able to just take the photos and not really worry about where they came from or who took the photo or at what point in the process they even took the photo and to have it all just populate into the right spot with the right data next to it and all that stuff is, um, yeah. is an absolute dream, you know, and yeah. even if we didn't have any site records or anything like that with this application, I mean, just photo management would save a, a ton of time. Right. Nancy, yeah. you check the questions. Yeah, yeah I was. Hi, Ann. Ann Paul now um, wants mm -hmm. to know what other programs are accompanying WildNote when you conduct your projects. Are you using ArcGIS Collector? What other What other kinds of? That's a great segue for. Um, yeah. What other apps are you using, Chris? <laughs> so I am not using Collector, and it's mostly because I don't have an Esri license. I use QGIS in my company. When I have a heavy GIS workload, I just don't have the time for it. I'm a small business, so I actually contract out the GIS work. Um, and when I need it, obviously I'm, I'm using a Trimble or something like that. I, I'm, I'm working with the EOS Arrow um, and its capabilities for um, doing submeter recording um, through different applications. But one application that I've, I've started using more and more for GIS work just on a, a, mo a mobile device, and I think it only works on iPhone, unfortunately, um, is called Touch GIS. And I think the subscription is like $30 a month, but it is totally and completely worth it. And the ability to just create feature classes and do different things and then export as Esri compatible shapefiles, which I've pulled into QGIS um, with, with all their symbology and everything that I put in on the device comes straight in as a shapefile. That's been an amazing application for me. So that's the only reason I don't use things like Collector and, and uh, um, Survey123 is because, well, they're Esri programs and they work best combined with Esri products, right? Um, and, and I just, I'm not using Esri products. So right. I try to use open when I can, uh, to be honest. And yeah. I try to use, um, uh, you know, those little more, little more compatible devices. <laughs> and so you use QGIS when you're, when you're using a mapping software? Yes. Okay. Yeah. When I bring all my data in and I have to produce my sketch and location maps and stuff like that yeah. and then send those shape files off to the agencies, um, yeah. I use QGIS. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Yep. And then uh, Tim Green would like to know if you've utilized WildNote for architecturally related cultural resources, for example, the National Register of Eligible Buildings. So I don't think we have the forms for that, but I have worked with an architectural historian here in Reno and I put together a quick form for her to collect data because that's the nice thing about WildNote is you can just make a form whenever you want for anything. And I made a form for her that we used just as a one-off on a project, it was a while back, and she collected the data she needed to do um, arch the architectural history report here in Nevada that's required. And uh, um, so that worked out. And, th and again, that is the nice thing about a configurable program is, is I was able to just say, okay, what do you need? Even if we didn't have like a fancy export, like we do on some of our CRM forms, I was able to just get her the ability to record the data virtually. And then I had access to it as the person running the project. And, you know, we could stay on top of what each other was doing. And that was, um, that just made it really easy to manage. So what about the Missouri yeah. project? That was architectural. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. Barn, yeah. So for the barn, yeah. Yeah, there was the barn and barn and farmstead forms, and then the um, there was actually an architectural another form as well. I can't remember what it was called, but we put those together for the state of Missouri, for a company that was working out there, and those were those were fun. So I guess in that case, yeah, we do have some official um, architectural forms for that state, and and they did what thousands thousands yeah. of data points out yeah. there. I mean, it was a it was a lot. Yeah. yeah, and they had and they had people working in different areas too. This was pre-COVID, but they had people in different offices that were in charge of different things, and they were able right. to easily access the data. So, yeah. so that's the thing with WildNote. First, is you can create any survey form you want. You have very, very no limitations on that. And then, if there's very specific agency um, reports that have to be submitted to the agency we can work with you to create those exports out of wild notes. So they come out exactly um, like the agency requires. Um, we already have that implemented for some things, kind of go state by state, depending on which customers come along. And so of course we've got the California DPRs. And then in this case, it was like the Missouri <laughs> <laughs> uh, historical building forms or something, right? So yeah. Um, yeah. 
Any other go-to apps you want to talk about, Chris? Uh, I'm trying to think. Honestly, I try to keep it simple in the field. Um, there is one that I used to use, but now with, with WildNotes documents feature, I actually don't use it anymore. But I used to use iAnnotate, which is a great PDF reader and organizer because it will store stuff inside, but also you can link to Dropbox and other stuff like that. iAnnotate is a great PDF um, not only PDF reader, but you can annotate on the PDF. So if you've got previously recorded site records you want to store on there uh, or something like that, you can you can take notes right on the records, which I've done in the past. Mm. And, uh, what about your sketch that. tool? Don't you have some fancy sketch thing that you I use? I do. I use graphic for sketching because certain <laughs> applications don't have sketch yet. But I use... Um, <laughs> Uh, I use graphic, which again, I think is an uh, iOS only, unfortunately, but it works really great. And on my, on my phone, I've used it to, you just take a picture of an object. That's the easiest thing to do. And basically like for projectile points for agencies that still require sketches um, and some of the BLM areas here in Nevada do, but you'll sketch out the projectile point just using that. And then I'll remove the photo layer and export it as a, as a JPEG. And I've done the same thing with excavations as well, doing a, a top down uh, picture of a excavation unit or a side picture of a profile. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, basically tracing the, um, it, it only takes one person too. Cause normally when you're doing a profile, sometimes if it's a bigger profile, you'll have two people, one taking the measurements and then one um, actually doing the uh, uh, writing down and, and doing the sketching. But if you just yeah. take a photograph of it, with all your measuring stuff on there, and then you have a two scale drawing and graphic, you can then just sketch out your drawing over the, uh, tracing it over the photograph, but still sitting in front of the wall to make sure you get it right. And graphic is just a, a fantastic vector layered drawing program for that. Okay. And it will export as like a Photoshop document or anything like that too. Very cool. So the next segment, and I know we have one more question. Um, we'll get to that too, Nancy. The next segment, is, I, usually it's called Kristen's Crazy Ideas, but since we have Chris here, <laughs> we're gonna call it Chris's Crazy Ideas. I have a crazy idea I think you're gonna talk about. Let's see what you come up with and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll add to it with this crazy idea I have of yours. So give us some crazy futuristic technology idea that you would like to see come to fruition. All right. Well, I've got two of them. One's super crazy and one's not so crazy. It okay. just requires a lot of money, right? Yeah. So the first not so crazy one is using all these data that we're collecting through our mobile devices and then augmented reality glasses to just take the data, Bluetooth it up to the glasses and say, listen, I've got spatial data for these projectile points. I've got the descriptions. I know what they are. And I'm collecting that information in like a mesh network from my crew uh, because we can't rely on like cellular networks. So we need the, via the devices to talk to each other. That's maybe okay. the only slightly crazy thing. Yep. And then displaying that on a crew chief's glasses in real time. So when I look up, I can see ping, ping, ping. And I see these little projectile points. I see the survey boundary. Yep. I see all kinds of stuff. I thought yep. about that years ago and I'm still surprised that we don't have it yeah. because all the technology is there for it. That's yeah. your not so crazy idea? Yes, because that one's possible now. You know, if I won the lottery, that's the first thing I would do is create that. Right? So, um, the next one. I know. And then the crazy idea is just, it really is just visualizing data differently. One thing I've always said that I don't want to do with digital archaeology is what I call paper on glass, which is really just taking a form. And a lot of people will do fillable PDFs, which I'll tell you what, if you're doing fillable PDFs, at least you're not using paper. I'll give you that. That's the first step. But that's paper on glass. That's, that's not utilizing this expensive, high-tech device for what it really is. And I want to visualize data in a different way. And while people are collecting things, I, I had the thought of seeing on a screen or really better off in like augmented reality glasses, of course, like almost bubbles of data. And the bubbles get bigger as, say, you know, projectile points. You're collecting more of those or you're collecting more glass or you're collecting more something. These little bubbles of data get bigger. And as you collect those data points, and then maybe they shrink again as your, and then maybe they coalesce into a, into a thing as you start finalizing all those pieces and really just looking at the site in a, in a completely different way from a completely different data visualization process. We're already collecting the data to be able to do that. It's just, let's think of a new, because our brains work graphically. We know that, right? Our brains right. work better when we're looking at pictures and we're looking at things. And just to be able to, because even with something like WildNote as a crew chief, you're managing a lot of information from your people and you could still miss something and say, well, we didn't actually take a GPS point over there or something like that. So yeah. having a better way to, 
visualize all that, I think would be interesting. And that's that bubble concept. I can't get it out of my head for some reason. <laughs> I love that bubble concept. I like the bubbles kind of coming together and forming apart as you want to combine. And right. see, yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. Nancy, you want to ask the question? The, the or Luke, Luke, who's on the East Coast, says, what if utilization for artifact cataloging on WildNote and associated other apps that would work well with it? Well, artifact cataloging from a site standpoint is, is what we do in WildNote, you know, right? right? Like, especially in like California has the artifact log. And just keeping track of those um, artifacts is, is super easy, you know, and you can do it from multiple sources and then, you know, bring them all in because we record artifacts in a number of different forms, uh, honestly, and then bring them all into one at the end. So from that standpoint, it's okay. But I don't know if Luke's talking about like, um, like lab laboratory artifact catalog cataloging or anything like that, but that wouldn't be a problem because you can just create the forms that you need and then use them in a laboratory situation and, and record all that information. And the nice thing is you can even move it through different stations and people could, you know, you can use our status updates to say, you know, this is the initial status for this artifact collection that we collected in the lab and then move it over to here. Somebody else opens it up, changes the status, and then somebody else finalizes and reviews and changes the status there. So yeah, the, I think if I answered this question right, the possibilities are, are definitely there. Hmm. All right, so I ended the poll, Rini. Can you see the results? Oh, yeah, let's see. Uh, looks like most popular area that people are conducting their cultural work in at this in this group is West California with mm -hmm. eight people um, collecting data here. Um, Northeast, what else? There's a lot. I mean, everybody, people are everywhere. Yeah. And, yeah, so very nice smattering of participants here. Um, Southeast, Southwest, Pacific Northwest. Great to see so much participation, you guys. I wonder if the Hawaii, Alaska was Hawaii or Alaska? <laughs> it's probably Alaska because Ann Pohl now is on it. Oh, group. I bet that's oh, yeah. it. I bet that's yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Well, so thank you so much, um, everyone. We are at now at the end of our time, um, of, of our half hour um, Lunch and Learn series. We will stick around and Chris actually is gonna show you some of our cultural and archeological uh, survey forms and functionality on Wild Notes. So if you wanna stick around for the next couple minutes, we'll do that. Our next webinar is Tuesday, September 8th. And we'll talk, be talking about stormwater, also known as SWIP. I've also heard it as SWIP PP. I don't know. Um, so <laughs> we're going to talk with Nathan Wright, who's an environmental specialist with Citizens Energy Group, uh, uh, water utility out in the great state of Indiana. Um, if you'd like to connect with us on social media, you can find us on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook and ping us in the chat if you would like to talk to us about using WildNote for your compliance projects. We are a compliance platform, which means you can do any kind of compliance work on the platform. And we know that one of a uh, huge part of compliance work can be cultural. And that's why we have our cultural product line. So thank you so much, Chris, for sharing your expertise with us and spending the half hour with us. And now let's, um, stick around and do a demo for people who, who want to stay. Awesome. Let's see. Where are we? Still got about 30 people on. Maybe I'll stop sharing, Chris, and you can share your screen. I will. I don't, oh, yeah, I got it right here. Let's okay, cool. Oh, it looks like we've got some stuff in the chat. Covering all the chat. Yeah, I've been chatting with the chatters. Oh, you're good. Okay, good. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to get right into this. If people have questions, I'm sure they'll let me know because um, I have about another 20 minutes I can do this. So this is how I, I just went right into my company um, on WildNote, honestly, just to show you guys how I'm using this. Great. And in fact, I even created some forms because, you know, once you have WildNote, you can use it for other things. And I created some forms to track my expenses in my RV. So that's what this logbook is over here. <laughs> yeah. So, but anyway, uh, we mentioned that one project that like that China Lake project, for example, um, I'll go into that one. Um, 
the nice thing is here, I, I can see all the data. Um, I can see the status of the field forms over here. Um, and I can see, uh, see the prime contractor still working on that one. And I can see all the different pages over here, but I can also sort by pretty much anything I want. And in this particular case, I had site numbers for all these. So I can sort by that to group them all together. And you can see here, um, we were using the California DPR forms that WildNote has. And WildNote is the only application that has, that you can buy right now that has the California DPR forms that does full continuation form support. And if those of you working in California or have ever worked in California, you know how important that is because it's a really hard problem to solve. Uh, for those not working in California, the first like five or six forms that you can use to record can only be one page. And the fields within those forms have to be continued on a continuation form after those. So you have to have like a dot, dot, dot and say continued here and then show where you're continuing from and just list all those uh, continued paragraphs on a continuation form. And WildNote does that automatically. It just figures it out, puts it where it needs to go. And I don't know how they did it, but they did it and it was amazing. So. Talk about a paper on glass problem, right? Oh my God, yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, honestly, that's the future is, is not even having to produce site records, just having visualized data that's accessible. So you can hit transmit on any one of these and send it to an information center or a ship yeah and then it just goes into a system and you only need like a site record whatever that means in 10 years yeah if you really just need something in your hands but we yeah. site records are going to go the way of you know other paper as soon as people really get used to the fact that we're collecting all this data digitally um so i i think that i think the time for those is probably coming to an end um at some point interesting um but yeah, the nice thing is here is as a project manager, I can come through and again, see the status. Uh, I can quickly review the forms and um, edit them if I need to uh, change, add information. I, I do my entire workflow on WildNote. Um, I don't do any printing. I don't do anything like this, this project I said I'm working on next week. I'm controlling the tech for this project. We're all taking a different phase, but DigTech is bringing the tech. So everybody's gonna be on WildNote, all three crews for all three companies. It's all coming into the same location. And they're like, well, so you can export these as PDFs, but then can those be edited? And I was like, why would you edit those? Because you're doing all your editing within WildNote. You're only exporting PDFs when we're ready to send them to the agency. In this case, the Forest Service. So all the work can be done here by anyone that has access to it. You can see we have repeaters. This one had a ton of features on it. So um, however many you have is however many you can do. I've done projects that had, I've done sites that had, you know, 80 to 100 features on them, you know, and other sites that had, you know, one feature or no features. Right. Uh, same thing with artifacts and stuff like that. So you can see everything going down the line here. And then uh, uh, when we get to, I just, I just got to show this for people that are still on. Uh, yeah. So got 27. Previously exported reports. Nice. And this, this is where WildNote really comes into play here. And, and a system like this is, uh, this is already exported. We'll show you the exports in a minute, but I just want to go straight to and show you what this thing looks like. Uh, and the nice thing is like these were exported a while ago, right? And they're mm -hmm. still here, they're still available. Uh, there's no problem with archiving. I don't have to run over to a file cabinet or something and say, hey, look at my piece of paper. Um, I know exactly where they're at. I don't have to worry about a file structure on my computer or you know, somebody else that didn't sync it to the company server or something like that. It's just accessible right here with our security protocols. And this is a massive site record too, which is why you see this bar. I'm on great internet too. Yeah. And this bar is moving real slow because it's cr crunching through a lot of data. I wonder how many pages report. this is. It's 30 plus, I think, with all yeah. the photos. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, while this is loading, Chris, that's what I noticed with a lot of newer customers is that they, they, they don't want to manage the complete digital uh, life cycle on the platform. They'll often export down to their servers and then manipulate the data. So now you've got a mismatch of data from the source system and the final reporting, which we, right. you know, obviously we, we want people to stay within WildNote so that that becomes the source of record that you can always go back to easily and find. Yeah. And that being said, you can also export all your data and have it if you would rather have it somewhere else. Right. You know, but there's no problem keeping it in WildNote. So, right. that, and that's another thing I think that'll change too, is people getting comfortable with that, yeah. you know, comfortable with leaving it in this situation. And yeah. if for some reason they close their company or they merge with somebody else and they want to get rid of their WildNote subscription, they can just right. download all their data and be done with it. Then they're and it's done. human readable and you're not, it's not in some weird file format that you're not going to be able to get to. That's yeah. another fear that archaeologists have. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. But this is the, um, 
this is the site record and you can see it already, it automatically did the pages here, uh, page one of 32. And uh, uh, this is the primary form for California. And then you go to the archeological site record and you can see some of these fields say C continuation, C continuation, um, because there's only a limited number of characters that you can put in there to keep this down to one page. That's mm -hmm. how we've um, designed this. Yeah. And then certain forms you can have multiple of, like these linear feature records, you can have more than one of these um, because they're a special type of feature form in California. Right. Uh, we had several because this was an airport, an old airport that we recorded. And then here you can see where the, where the real change happens between this program and other programs. Like, sure, you can put together forms in Survey123. I used to use tap forms before I knew about WildNote. You, right. can, you don't really put together forms in there, but you can export into like a mail merge document on Word. But still, you can't do this. You can't do this unless you're going to do it manually or you're a developer, a software right. developer. <laughs> and right. You know how to do those things. Because this says right here, here's the things continued from the primary record. Here's the things continued from the archaeological site record. And it tells you, these are the features. Um, you know, you go on down the line past the features. Here's your cultural constituents, your disturbances. Yeah. And it just says continued, and it's perfect. Mm -hmm. um, and it tells you exactly which one you're looking at. And it's just... Um, uh, it's amazing. And then keeping with the format, we next go to the sketch map. And to do these, uh, I should zoom out just a little bit. Um, to do these, you know, your, your GIS department, while you're working on the um, site stuff, this is a separate form. So they can come into this form, they can create their sketch map, and then just upload it as a JPEG uh, or whatever they want. JPEG is probably best straight into here. And then WildNote does the rest of the formatting. It puts the... Um, you know, all this information is on a form. They just upload this as an image and WildNote has formatted this to show up on this form um, perfectly. Same mm -hmm. thing with the location map. And then you come down here to the photo record and here's where another super cool thing happens that we're able to do. And this is in our, our, our custom CRM forms too. This doesn't happen just naturally. Uh, we've put these together like this, but I was thinking again, try not to think paper on glass and trying to think outside the box with how we're doing site recording with the digital method. In a lot of cases, you'll have a crew of four, maybe three. You'll have somebody filling out uh, overall paperwork, you know, big site information, somebody doing photographs and somebody doing um, GPS work, right? And maybe another person helping to record artifacts and features. So you've typically got like three different people, maybe four going to every single point on the site. Well, I was like, why are we doing that? We have a device that'll take photos. We have a device that'll do a GPS point in some cases. And, and that might be the only thing that people have now is a separate GPS person for various reasons. But, and we have a device that will record all the information. So in all the forms, whether you're in an artifact form, linear feature form, archeological um, site recording form, and we do this for the Nevada ones too. But regardless of what form you're in, or even the photograph record, you could just be in that yeah. as a form for that. Wherever you take photos, it doesn't matter. It all comes back to the photo record here and it sorts by date and time. Yeah. And so you see all the information that California requires. Um, this one ended up being about two pages. Mm -hmm. And then you see all the photos in the same order that they were on the, um, on the record there. And again, this is all the information required by California. The Nevada ones look different because Nevada requires different information, the BLM does. Right. So that's amazing. Uh, and again, if you just printed out the photo logs, imagine how much time you could save. <laughs> <laughs> but uh so this is um this is it this is super cool um, i'm going to be using the nevada version of all this uh the california one's just a little bit more flashy because california itself is a little more flashy yeah so i wanted to show that one but the nevada one is is really similar and i'm putting that together right now I'm, I, I haven't actually set the project up but i'm going to be inviting in you know three two other companies and their employees to come into this project right. and uh and hopefully help show them the glory that it is wild note as well. And, uh, and then have them take that back to their companies. But the nice thing is we're all doing this together and it's a, it's a, it's a collaboration unlike one I've done before. And one I think wouldn't be possible without a system like this, because as I said, we're doing, uh, we're splitting up the field work in thirds as far as acreage goes, right. just because this client is really tight on time. And then my company is doing all the site record preparation and we're, we're collecting all the data through wild note from all the, all the people Another company is writing the report and she's going to be pulling out report data from the site record data right. for that, that has been collected. And she's in Utah, um, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, or really Ogden. And then another company down in Moab, Utah, is doing all the mapping work. So they're, they're taking all the mapping data from the field crews. They're producing the sketch maps and location maps. Yeah. And everybody 
is uploading from three different locations information into Wild Down. Nice. And not to mention, I'll be finishing up most of the site records as we're traveling in an RV across the country. To the <laughs> East Coast. So, you know, we're managing to get this project done in, within the client's time frame, exceeding the client's expectations from three different companies bringing all this information into a single report. And I can't think of a time frame in the past when we would have been able to do that without this sort of collaboration. It's like, welcome without this sort of technology. Future. Yeah. Welcome to the future, people. Well, Chris, I know you got to run off to a meeting. Um, thank you so much for doing yeah. the demo and for coming and sharing your experience with digital archaeology. And we're really so grateful to have you as an advisor to our company and to have you um, help us steer the platform in a direction to keep adding value to your industry. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, thank you, absolutely. Chris, so much. Thank okay. you. All right.